Welcome everyone to this second meeting of the Bridge Book Club intermissive course with the author Tatiana Mota. Uh, today we are going to discuss uh, test one, absent or oh, chapter one, absent of mortifying doubts, and chapter two, sense of immortality. Just to remind everyone, we uh, this meeting will be recorded so everyone can watch it again or also those that cannot be here today they can watch it another time so the discussion is not going to be recording so be free to talk right and now i hand it to over to tatiana hello everyone Good to see your faces again, and um, I hope you have read the chapters and done your homework. <laughs> How is everyone doing? So let's get started. So today we are going to be discussing uh, chapter one and two, as Magali had just said. But before we start, I want to hear from you guys. How uh, was the first uh, month, almost a month, right? Four weeks? Yeah. Um, yeah, of thinking about your intensive courses, reflecting about your proexis and the themes of these chapters. So if you could now write in the chat um, your ideas of what you perceived if you had any ideas or experiences during this time and um i want to hear from you guys did you did you um have any kind of insight or ideas while reading the chapters or the themes let Tatiana, me know. Can, I just, can I just ask, would you prefer people write it or can people unmute themselves and speak? It It's up whoever, uh, we don't have many people, so whatever you guys prefer. If you prefer to write in the chat, it's it's totally fine. And But if you want to speak, great. Hey, Ligia, how are you? Hello, nice to see you all again. <laughs> That's lovely. Hey, Sergey, how are you doing? Good, thank you. Good, good to see you. Hey, Grace, how are you? Hello, I'm really glad to be here and uh, looking forward to today's conversations. Awesome. And you, Fernandez, where are you with this image on your background? I that's Fujisan on my background. Yeah, I'm okay. I'm in Japan. That's a lovely view from your hotel. <laughs> Just a virtual. <laughs> <laughs> okay, guys. So I want to hear from you. Did you see any passage from the chapters that you read? that drew, drew your attention or did you have any ideas? Did you think about uh, any experiences you've had related to these chapters? Uh, can I say, <laughs> the only thing that really has comes up to my memory is that I've always thought that life is an adventure and as well as death. Death, that death is also an adventure. And I, that thought was in my mind when I was very young. Um, th that's all I can say. You know, it's it's an interesting thought from a very young person. And obviously I still believe it. <laughs> and when did you, do you uh, did you remember, Sergey, the, do you have like the earliest memory of thinking about life as an adventure and death 
sometime when I was in primary school. Wow. That's interesting. Yeah, it's and, always been there. <laughs> yeah. And did you did you find anyone you could speak about this uh, back then? No. No. <laughs> that's that's interesting. Mm. Lonely, lonely uh, period of time in your life, probably. Sometimes we feel we just don't have anyone, don't have no peers to talk about this kind of stuff, right? Mm. Mm. True. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, I see some new people today. So welcome everyone. And um, I'm Tatiana. And today we are discussing the first two chapters that we were supposed to, to read, to have read in the last, last month. So the first chapter talks about uh, the absence of mortifying doubts. And I'll just give some, um, like a little idea, an overview of the chapter, right? I know this has to do mainly uh, with doubts in this aspect related to the life, the existential program. And sometimes people have doubts of the capacity or the ability they have in their lives to actually um, do their praxis, right? The existential program. So here, I guess most of you guys or everyone that I can see here in on my screen have studied conscientiology already and have some uh, some experience, right? And maybe, and then you are going to tell this to me. I want to uh, ask you this to you guys. Maybe you have the the idea or the conviction that you have done an intermissive course or the, at least that you have prepared yourself for some kind of tasks when before you were born and that you have this sense that you need to, you have some tasks that you need to do and um, um, some achievements that you need to, to have in your life. And through our lives, sometimes we have some kinds of fears and doubts that prevent us from uh, stepping out of our comfort zone, right? And this is what I wanted to start discussing with you guys in terms of chapter one, because the chapter talks about, um, mainly about fears and self-confidence, right? Sometimes people have the uh, some kind of phobia okay i don't know if it's the case with you guys but sometimes they they don't but they have some kinds some kinds of fears that um prevent them from doing a little more or doing much more so uh, i want to hear from you guys if you have ever thought about it in your case and in our uh, intermission last, last meeting, which was your homework, I asked you guys to think about and find real life examples that related to these chapters, right? So I wanted to hear from you guys if you, uh, what kind of ideas you thought about and, um, and share with us. Does anyone want to share any ideas on this chapter one? What I was thinking when I was reading this, this test one, absent of, absence of mortifying doubts. I was reading in Portuguese. I, I thought it was much better in Portuguese anyway. But it's like, it's at a certain degree, I think. It's not like a hundred percent. Like there is like a scale, I would think, you know, like. I don't know. That's the idea came to my mind when I was reading. 
What do you mean uh, about a, a scale, Fernandes? Ah, for example, uh, um, instead of just like, ah, uh, it's, um, it's like a hundred percent, like, you know, you are a hundred percent convinced of this all the time in your life. No, of course that there are some times in life that you are um, more afraid of taking a further step or, you know, like more in doubt, you know, this kind of thing. Yeah. Does it make sense? Yes, yes. Yeah, I, 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 I'm sure that all of us many times in our lives have um, gone through times that were more difficult, right? It was like a new challenge. Maybe you had a new role, a new job, or a new relationship or a family problem or something that you didn't know how to deal with. And obviously, you have doubts, you have fears, you don't know what to do. And it's uh, it's part of life, right? The main problem is when uh, you have these fears and these doubts, they take over. You stop. It, it, it prevents you from using your will to overcome these challenges. So this is the main problem. So what we are going to do um i don't know it, it, does anyone else want to to share any ideas about yeah magali yeah no i just want to compliment that because i think the main uh, the main uh, thing in this chapter is to understand this mortifying uh, fear because it's different from normal fear that we all experience that like you're saying right and so um, I think it's uh, this insecurity that you're talking, you, you say in the book that the person cannot even, you know, go out of their home or doing something uh, with their life. They are totally freezing. You no, know? it's the fear that frees you in life. So uh, maybe they, they might, don't know, you can tell us, Tati, that you have studied more the subject. It's about like all the intermissive they have a, a courage installing them to face the fear. Seems like we are vaccinated a little bit about fear and we can, um, I'm not saying always, but many times facing it, right? Yeah, I heard um this person talking about uh, challenges with the praxis a uh, few uh, many years ago and uh, they said something like this when you plan your existential program e which is challenging right it's something that's gonna be different from everything you have done before and it's going to be hard and it's going to be challenging and it's going to be frustrating sometimes. So, um, but you, you don't set goals to yourself before you were born that you cannot achieve, that you, you cannot fulfill, right? So whoever, like any of us now, if you have like a very difficult situation if you, that you're going through, and it seems there is no end. It's so hard. It's so difficult. You can't see a way out of that. There is a way out. It's just that at the moment, moment you can't see it. But it doesn't mean that you you don't have the power to overcome that, right? I see two people raising hands. So who is this? You, I have uh, Benoit. Is this Benoit? How do you say your name? Sorry. Uh, Benoit. Benoit, hi, how are you? Hi, I'm fine, thanks. Uh, it's a French name. Yes. Um, so, yes, I just wanted to, to say something about that. Uh, the fact that uh, I think uh, you, you may have a lot of fear uh, until you 
uh, really deeply know what your uh, what what your existential program is about, because at the point you know that for the rest of your life, uh, I think uh, there is no way that the fear come uh, too much in front of you. You 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 have fear like everyone, but at the point you know what you have to do here. Uh, you don't have uh, like uh, 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 mortifying doubts because you know why you you you've coming here. Excellent point, and I agree with you. It it really makes sense. It's not um, you, as intermissivists, we do have moments where we are just. You know, we can't breathe, right? Challenges are so difficult. But we know where we have to go. And sometimes we don't know 100%, but we know what we can't do anymore, right? At least we know what we, which ways we are not going anymore. And this helps a lot already. So... What helps us be more aware of this reality and uh, face these doubts and these fears is getting to know more about why you are living this life. How did you prepare for this life? What are the main aspects that you need to overcome in this life? And in which point are you at the moment and what you need to do, right? So when you are aware, at least more and more each time through self-research about this, at least you know where you need to go. And this, um, this is, gives us some sense of uh, self-confidence, right? And I see Melanie as well uh, wanting to ask a question or a comment. Um, <clears throat> uh, just a comment uh, about this. Um... I am just coming out of a phase where, well, I won't call it mortifying doubt, but where, well, after, during and after the pandemic, like a lot of, I think a lot of people struggled and rethought their lives uh, during that time. <clears throat> and I've, it's my relationship with my pro exes, and I do have a very strong sense of what it is. And I have a very kind of strong compass that usually immediately like, throws a fit if I am not in line with what I need to do but sometimes life just happens and then you are in a situation that is not ideal for you or you are in a place that is not ideal for you and that is kind of like preventing you from accessing more mental somatic ideas or, or that kind of stuff and I've just recently been in the country during the pandemic I returned to my home country and the whole of the scene was so, so, so heavy that I really started feeling I'm distancing myself from the extension program. And I'm starting to have more and more doubt. <clears throat> Deep inside, I knew, hold up a second. That's not right. But it was really encompassing. It was really kind of, kind of felt trapped to some degree. And in that time, I also kind of even distanced myself from conscious logical ideas which was an alarming sign to me because I'm doing this for 10 years. But many times what triggered a lot of anxiety in me towards the complexes is reading some conscientology books and just, or like even, you know, listening to some presentations and people are like, oh, you have to write a book and you have to write lots of articles and you have to be financially independent that you have to do all of these amazing things evolutionary dual and i don't know what and of course i'm in europe so my situation is very different from you know people in brazil but often i would compare or i would like okay but i'm not ticking these boxes i have different challenges that i need to overcome there are different existential needs i need to address but many times that got to me, oh, I am 32, I haven't written a book yet. Oh, I'm 32, I haven't written a verbeche yet. <clears throat> I don't speak Portuguese. I have not read all the books. You know what I mean? It's like there was the, this, the kind of distance to me and other people in conscientology 
quote unquote doing their proexis. And me here in Europe, having a very different situation, I sometimes felt, okay, but am I doing anything? Like, so that that kind of like if unchecked and if especially in a diff in a difficult situation like the pandemic when you're so isolated, this can really start even if it's maybe not mortifying, but this can really get heavy in terms of um, you not taking a wrong turn at some point. So now I have the, at the beginning of this year I started realizing what is wrong that I needed to place the change the country to be more open again, to kind of, you know, establish again a condition for me to do the proexis better. So I, ch I just changed country, which is a huge stress and whatever, but I already feel better. But a lot of heavy decisions sometimes are involved to get out of that doubt and that anxiety. And even within conscientology, sometimes I feel a lot of doubt because I am not fulfilling what these books are telling me to do. Welcome aboard. <laughs> it's not easy, right? Yeah, I I feel you, Melanie. It's it's really challenging, and um, and you know, throughout these years, I have studied concentrology. I have uh, learned a lot. I have written this book. I have uh, given I. I lost count already of how many lectures and classes and stuff I have done in concentrology. And um, still, it's not easy, you know. There's always something else that it's it seems it's uh, I'm not doing. So I guess it, it, it doesn't end because evolution doesn't end, right? Even if I told you, Melanie, today you uh congratulations you finished your whole praxis you are done and then what what are you gonna do just sit there and celebrate and then it's done so there's always something else right uh i guess what helps deal with these doubts and these challenges is the mindset that we set to ourselves you know how to deal with these um, challenges and the things that we know that we need to do without uh, feeling um, too, you know, like, how can I explain that? The way you see these challenges with the, you know, the, the stress of, always having to do something that always you have you you just cannot deal with all the things at the same time and that's okay and and that's part of life and it doesn't mean that you are not doing anything so have this you know balance is important as well but i i don't want to speak more because i have other people raising hands so um uh, Lisa, do you want to say your uh do you want to comment and then benoit yes um i just want to share when i read this uh, chapter i reminded myself the time when i was uh, a young person <laughs> full of dreams and full of challenge uh, especially regarding my profession and i had no idea about consensuality at that time so uh, for me, the most um, difficult um, regarding these doubts was to be alone, loneliness. This was really hard for me. I had nobody. I tried. I tried different groups, different people, different approaches. But at some point, it did not uh, help me to answer my questions, my, my doubts. So I was like uh, searching searching but I could not find so I, I only accessed consensuology much later uh, six years ago so um, this is a counterpoint to what Melanie just uh, brought to the debate because um, for her I think she got a lot of inputs and information and the groupality but this um, 
might have uh, uh, overpressure on her. So proaxis for me, as I understand now, I mean, I was, I was always doing something for my proaxis, although I was not aware about it, yeah? And the things I did was like uh, more my intuition, my perceptions, my insights, but mostly things I did help me a lot now in consensuality. So I was building up uh, like a, a ground for the things I have to do now that I'm engaged in this uh, maxi proexis, if we say so. Yeah, so I think it's uh, important to have this flexible view about our proexis and to make the best we can do at that particular moment. Because if I was going back and looking everything I did before, I would do many things in a different way from a, a, a perspective of a consensual paradigm, but this was not possible. So what can I do now? This is my main point. And not to see as a pressure, you have to do this, you have to do that. I think every intermissivist has one singularity regarding his or her proaxis. And this is important to know, you know, it's not the case of now I'm, I have to go to such country and to develop this and that, or to give courses or to write a book. No, you have to stop and think what is the point now, yeah? So just to, to share these ideas because my, my way is quite different from most intermissivists and to share this idea that groupality is very important. Uh, this would help me a lot if I had met other intermissivists at a younger age. But now I'm very happy to be, <laughs> to be where I am. And, and actually, this question to move countries, I think it's very common for many intermissivists who have an international praxis. You know, I also moved countries several times in my life. And uh, now I'm in Germany, actually. Uh, not leaving, but you know, I have one one foot here, one foot in Brazil, and maybe <laughs> I have to travel to other countries. So to be flexible, I think it's very important. Awesome. Benoit? Yes. Um, so yeah, I, I really can relate about what uh, Melanie said, because uh, I think uh, when you are uh, deeply uh, aware of your praxis, and especially in a young age, uh, you may uh, pu put yourself a lot of pressure. And uh, I think there is two ways to deal with this pressure. The, the first way is to uh, remember that, um, well, praxis is something you choose after all. So even if uh, you don't do it in a perfect way, uh, you always can go back if you want or do, do something else but uh, there is it it's really something you choose so even if it's not uh absolutely in the way you would uh want it to be uh, uh it's it's fine and the second thing is i think uh a lot of this comes from the uh, because a lot of Praxis, and I think especially in a, in a, in intermissivist people is about uh, helping people, and that's a good thing. <laughs> but uh, I think uh, uh, there is a lot of um, uh, how can I say uh, seriousness about the human condition. Uh, but the thing is, when you when you um, when you try to experience and you actually experience uh, some other way to uh, to be uh in uh, in different dimensions uh what you do in here is really important but it's it's okay if it's uh not like like i said it's okay if it's not perfect because you can you can interact in many many ways in many many uh places of uh, of the reality so yeah uh i think this is another way but I, i'm not sure that uh, melanie can uh, relate to that but uh, this is a thing to uh, take a little bit of uh, 
of uh, a perspective about the human experience uh, because uh, well we are in we all talk about concepts that are sometimes outside uh, of the human experience and it helps to better understand the human experience yeah and uh, Melanie, another thing that I thought while um, while I was here listening to everyone speaking is that moving to a different country is not something easy. So take it easy. <laughs> you know, give yourself some time. I don't know how long have you been um, in the new country. So give yourself six. Yeah, so really. Um, I remember I heard Professor Valvira used to say when we moved to a different city, we, we had to give ourselves at least six months so we could, you know, settle in and get used to the new routine and all that and not, you know... Um, be so stressed because we are not doing what we wanted to do or we needed to do or we felt we had to, you know, just move to a different city and just, you know, hit the ground running and continue doing whatever we were doing before. And uh, th this just doesn't happen. So just give yourself some time. You are not moving cities, you're moving countries. So this is even more challenging. So if you have to, you know, just focus on your intraphysical life for a few months and try to organize your life. And this, this will help you later on with the other stages, you know, but don't feel like you are not doing anything. You're doing a lot already just by, by moving to a different country, how many things and challenges or, you know, things that, that you had to do to to actually be there at the moment you know uh, i guess magali wants to say something yes came to me the idea of bottleneck hey i don't know if everyone knows this uh, this concept that is like you know certain part of our life we have big challenges and so all the we we came with the wide thing and then we enter in this really difficult situation where there is a lot of pressure there so we have more intruders we have more difficulties and so the in this point we all pass through bottlenecks right so we need more energy and we feel like our thoughts are not so good, our energies is not so good, because it's a challenge we have to <clears throat> overcome. And uh, sometimes change is something inside of us, but not give up. And then when we pass through this bottleneck, we overcome them. Then we have again space to think and our energies and more, we can understand better things. So I don't know if you related with that, Melanie, but there is a verbiety about it. So sometimes we all, I think as intermissivists, we have challenges and it's, it's big challenges. And so sometimes we just need to be kind to ourselves and see that we, we pass to those situations and don't give up. Thanks, Magali. So does anyone else want to comment on this first chapter? Or the ideas that you had throughout the four weeks? Okay, cool. So yeah. if, yeah? Uh, that's all right, I'll comment on the all next right. chapter. Go ahead. Um, was, and I also read it in Portuguese, so I'm just going to translate it, but it's um, uh, that self self-confidence isn't based only by acknowledging our qualities, but also by um, becoming aware of our, our mistakes 
our weaknesses and our immaturities, right? Um, yeah, I find I just found that's that's been um, a really important part of 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 my life, I guess, over over um, the last few years. I think there's been a lot of uh, and and it kind of ties in a little bit. I think what people were talking about this feeling of um, perhaps having deviated from our paraxes or, or losing sight of it. Um, like going through phases in my life where I was really confronting um, things that were missing in myself, my weaknesses and my immaturities, um, were also phases in which I felt quite disconnected from my existential program because there was a lot of self-doubt about how can I, you know, with all these issues and all these struggles, possibly have a complicated paraxis, like this sort of self-doubt would come in, right? These, I guess it's like the mortifying self-doubt, right? But but those phases, I mean, that, that those phases are really important, I think, to, uh, I guess, do internal recycling that then allows us to step into a new stage, right? I think there are these these stages in life around our existential program as well. So, um, yeah. Yeah, it's really interesting. I connected what you said uh, to with Magali had just said about the bottlenecks. You know, you have. Um, well, I experienced that. I had moments that I was feeling great. I was, you know, in my comfort zone. And then there was this challenge, which stressed me. Um, and it was, I had self-doubts of my ability and capacity to do things. And, um, but I knew I had to do it. And I just you know, make, made myself, forced myself to, you know, go through those challenges and, and whatever I had to do, which was not easy. And then after that, I would be able to, you know, breathe again and feel more confident and look back and see what I did wrong, what I did right, what was the traits that I had that uh, made things more difficult for me to overcome these challenges and what helped me actually overcome them so I guess this is what makes us strong if we know what we have the strengths we have but with the weaknesses as well because when someone points this to us and we know already that we have these traits we just um, are working with them right working on them trying to overcome these these weak traits and uh, this um, makes like you know the conscientiogram you know all those traits and characteristics and uh, abilities and um, so it, the more we know the whole thing you know the whole soma the attribute attributes that we have the more uh, self-confidence we have because we know which evolutionary level we actually is or we actually are. So I remember when I was in Brazil before moving to Australia, I did the whole concentrogram. So I had the whole concentrogram. I printed my graphic and I, you know, I was very happy with it. And then I moved to Australia. That didn't exist anymore. <laughs> <laughs> what I thought, uh, you know, I had like the uh, strong traits that I thought were awesome, were perfect. They actually were not because um, back in Brazil, the environment that I was living in was um, making those strong traits strong because I had the support of the peers, of the Holothocene, of the group, of the activities I was doing. Um, so when that was, when I was away of that environment, then it was the real me, only me. And I could see that those traits were not like those that good anymore. You know, I was like, mm, okay, <laughs> liar. So, and then on the other hand, traits that I thought that I didn't have or that, uh, I had, um, weak traits that I thought I had for some reason 
uh, I found a way in my, you know, in the challenges, the new challenges that I had by moving to Australia. Uh, I had to use things and, and and tools that I didn't even know that I had. And I was like, oh, wow, I would, I never thought I would be able to overcome this like this quick or do, you know, look for different solutions in a different way. So, and this made my concentrogram today totally different. And this is what is awesome when you are aware of, you know, the experiences you have in life will make you more um, aware of your own reality, not what you imagine you have or you are, but the, the facts, right? The facts are that are that what really count, right? Cool. Good, good, good. Let's go ahead. So guys, um, take a, a piece of paper and a pen or open a file on your computer. And I'll give you a, a, an activity to do, okay? So we are going to break out rooms now, um, still on the chapter one of these uh, mortifying doubts. And um, we are going to do the, the, the following activity. So we are going to think, I'm going to give you now a hypothetic situation, okay? And you are going to be discussing this. So what is the idea? I'm going to introduce you to Margaret. Okay, Margaret is a lovely uh, lady, young lady. She is 35 years old. And uh, take your notes, okay? And she has no partners, no kids. She thinks she's an intermissivist or she has an idea that she has... Um, you know, a life project or something that she needs to do in her life. Uh, she knows about parapsychism and very intelligent person. And, um, but at the moment, she's stuck in her comfort zone. Okay. She's, she's doing pretty well professionally. She's, um, um, be uh, successful she does a great job she has great friends her life looks pretty good she doesn't have any kind of you know big challenges in her intraphysical life however she just doesn't you know jump out of her comfort zone there should be some issues some something that is going on and uh, she feels that she could be doing more but she's not. And so what are you guys going to discuss is, first, I want you guys to give me three possible reasons why uh, Margaret is going through this moment in her life. Just remember, she's 35 years old. What we say uh, hypothetically is that when you are around 35 is that you have you, the executive time of your pro is right you have like till your 30s to prepare to download information to learn to study to experience the intraphysical life and then at around 35 you you have all the knowledge and the recuperation of cons from your intermissive course and then you are going to action you're going to put the ideas into practice, right? Use your, you use your leadership. So she's at that moment, okay? So you're going to discuss three possible reasons why this person who is intelligent has, you know, a good intraphysical life. She doesn't have any mortifying doubts, any critical problems, issues, but something is preventing her from moving forward so what could be the reasons and you also are going to think about three possible actions that she can do to um, change this right to start doing something more to go into the next stage in her pro -axis. okay did you get it so any questions so Magali can you put the question Yes. 
Is she unhappy? Um, she's not depressed or in intraphysical melancholy, mm. but she's like, I'm stuck. Something doesn't smell good, you know, like, you know, like, you know, in the end of the day, Sunday night, mm. she's maybe like, hmm. And she's know, asking for help? Yeah, she's asking for help. Okay. Okay. So, guys, I'm going to give you um, 14 minutes. <laughs> okay. And then we come back so you guys can share with uh with us with everyone your ideas okay okay just one question uh, the last uh, thing that you ask is to give uh, some yeah uh three actions that she could do practical things that she could do to start getting out of the situation okay okay well, Let's do it. Everyone is here now. Oh, okay. So guys, I want to hear from you. So what do you think are, why is Margaret, she's successful at her work. She has great friends. She doesn't have any mortifying doubts in her life. She's intelligent. She's um, in her 30s, young. So what, what, is, what is wrong in your opinion? She's an intermissivist. She thinks she's an intermissivist. So what could be possible reasons why she's in stuck in her comfort zone? And uh, what are the... Well, let's go first with the what you think um, is going on, okay? Who wants to talk i'm curious i am just arriving in the group but uh, i was telling to ken that uh, perhaps intrusion i think is one of the mo the 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 worst problem of uh, humanity uh, as valdo vieira already told us and I think the, the Margaret's problem perhaps is one of uh, the problem. Uh, other one is uh, the will, uh, lack of will. That is a big, uh, um, a big problem to don't put uh, a goal in practice. Don't don't get to a goal. Sometimes we begin something, but our will um, uh, is so weak, and we don't go on on our on our goals. And praxis um, demands some will, some a lot of will <laughs> to to realize and. I think this problem, these two problems are very uh, big, um, uh, um, uh, neck, uh, oral necks. Yeah, that our that impeaches our praxis, uh, stucks our praxis. Yes, Anna was in my group, and also Maria, and Maria also. Uh, brought that uh, idea of intrusion uh, that uh, was something that comes in the group and also robotization because of the culture material things you know robotization can be another one and fear that is the common one so more or less what we brought in the group um i think one theme that came up in uh, my group was with uh, with grace and pamela um, and lack of motivation was a recurring theme. We're looking at it from different angles and it was always seemed to be, for so some reason, a lack of motivation that's there. And for me, what arose in that context, you, you it's, and it's funny because in your book, you talk about 
uh, Tatiana, you mentioned the, I think something like the myth of um, evolution as suffering or evolution through suffering or something. Um, but um, I was talking, we're talking about how crisis does often lead to evolution. And we just talked a bit about it, like the bottlenecks are crisis moments, right? When we go through hard times. Um, and certainly I found that life crises generally lead to the biggest shifts. And so she seems to have a lack of crisis in her life. It's, everything is easy. She's got, oh, everything is flowing. And, blah, blah, blah. and so somehow she needs to create crisis um, for herself. <laughs> Okay, so I hope you guys created, uh, put some um, actions about this <laughs> for the solution. <laughs> uh, how she can do this uh, and create some crisis in her life. But we yeah, can see kids. this later on. <laughs> <laughs> um, very interesting, guys. I love what you're saying because this really makes sense. It could be these could be all reasons right and is there any other group that hasn't uh shared yet yeah we we came to different uh, possible reasons here because as she mentioned that she might think that she might be a intermissivist so we conclude that she might be experiencing melin uh, at this stage in her life <clears throat> and also, she, so we consider the possibility that because she's single, there is this internal conflict, like a lack of partner, you know, like a, a support or something. And so it's not bringing any challenge or so she focused too much on just the interphysical life. Um, and also in this area, uh, at this stage in life, she's, she, you mentioned she's 35. She might be wondering about uh, parenthood and career and like, oh, what, which path should I choose in life? You know, this. So that's it. Yeah, makes sense because at this stage in her life, um, she it seems from what I like the, the information I give to you guys that she is doing pretty well in many aspects of her life, but uh, in her personal life, she doesn't, um, maybe she's not looking into it because she doesn't have a partner, she doesn't have a family. Uh, we talked in our group, maybe she's a workaholic, right? Could be. And instead of um, giving the some time to other aspects of her life, she's just focusing on work where she knows she's she's doing it well, right? Any other groups? We also talk in our group about uh, she not being fully present in her life, maybe, and also about her parapsychic. Maybe she's not using her parapsychist to do, I don't know, assistential things. Maybe her parapsychist is only as a escapist, used as an escapist from the real life. And we think that this was an important, important thing to avoid by everyone. So Next I time. didn't <clears throat> I didn't really have a group. I was alone in the breakout room, but <laughs> I still thought about it. Uh, <clears throat> regarding okay. the reasons of why she feels like that, um, I didn't think about it that much, maybe because it's a little bit too close to my own reality. Um, but what she could do is, you know, consider starting and preparing for Penta, because that will create a crisis for her. And I can say that <laughs> from experience. <laughs> like, if you if your life is good, but then you start preparing for Penta, then whatever crisis you didn't go through, you will go through in preparation. Um, <clears throat> to do just general self-research, what are your strengths, what are your weaknesses, your values in life, what is important to you? Um, that will show you a lot of things in your life that where should you go, what should you change? And then the one more year of life technique could help her as well to find a direction.
Really good. Sorry about that, Melanie. You are not alone, okay? We are with you. <laughs> no it worries, was... I'm used to it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so next time you you just scream and we will find out a way to, to put you in a group or everyone, okay? Guys, uh, I guess our group spoke already. Our group. Oh, may, maybe who who from our group? Michiko, do you want to? Oh, Michiko said her internet is not good. So she's going to write here. Okay. Another reason might be self-intrusion. People talk about intrusion, right? Yes. And self-intrusion as well. I agree with you. Having fears of failing, being judged, for example. Yes, definitely. Could be, right? And uh, maybe this is the reason, could be the reason that she doesn't have will or motivation, as some of you guys said, right? No will and no motivation, lack of motivation, because actually it could be fear, right? If I'm afraid to do something new or different, that is, um, I don't know if I'm going to be successful. Uh, I'm not going to be motivated to do that or have the will to do that. And what Melanie said makes really sense because aligning your, like doing self-research, aligning yourself with your values will give you motivation to uh, have the will and, and uh, overcome these things, right? Get out of the comfort zone. Um, uh, I was thinking here when, uh, while you guys were speaking that, I guess in this case could be like all of these things that you, you guys said could be a reason, right? But if you guys think about something in your life that you really wanted to do to achieve, weren't you able to achieve that? Have a think. Have a think about something in your life that you really wanted to it doesn't matter if it was like good or bad, ethical or not, but you really want it. Didn't you get it? So we have will. Everyone has will. It, it, it has just to be focused if I don't have it. Why not? Right. But guys, we are uh, we, we are running out of time. I want you guys to give me the, the solutions, the actions. What could be good actions? I guess Melanie started, right? Talking about the values and the penta. Any other actions that she could do right away? I can start. Uh, things we listed here, I think very important. We conclude that the self-research is the basic because if she doesn't know herself, you know, what can she do, ne? Ne, sorry. Yeah. And uh, the for the so she has to step out of her comfort zone, right? Like so, she has to try something different. Uh, can be anything that can be find new group, new connections, or you know, just do something different and find a purpose in life. She she thinks she. She is here for something bigger, but she doesn't know what it is. So just find something that you think is bigger, important for you and give it a go. Yeah, makes makes sense. And um and Michiko, she sent uh she's still like sending messages here in the chat, if you can see. Uh, she talked about working with energies and um and Lena, she maybe connected to what you, what you have just said, Fernandez. Uh, she talked about doing sports or hobbies, that this could be a way. And we we ended up uh, thinking that it could help her work with energies, right? Do like consensual hygiene and also meeting groups of people, new people that would be connected to what you, what you have just said. And Michiko just said here, take a one small step at a time so that it doesn't feel overwhelming to step out of her comfort zone. I 100% agree with that. And I think this is one of the most import important things for us, especially us 
intermissivist and you know most of us are have this you know weight on our shoulders that we have a praxis and we need to fulfill every aspect of it so if we do a little every day in the end we are going to be able to do a lot right but go ahead guys what else i think we pretty much had the things that fernandez just talked about um probably the only other thing so like volunteering towards something with others finding a goal following your happiness i think pamela talked about finding the thing that makes you feel come extra alive and put energy into that and follow that and then uh, i think i'm not sure if somebody mentioned like basically doing therapy of some kind concerts of therapy your own some other therapy but uh that sort of self-confrontation that then hopefully can generate a, a, a crisis of you know understanding self-understanding but also a sort of a crisis by that we get when we are confronted with our um the, the all those things we talked about before the weak traits the missing traits the um yeah our outdated conditioning all those sort of things yeah i think that what uh, fernandez said and kim said that is in certain point of life you feel a crisis um, and, I mean, and that will make you go on and step forward because you you know that you have to change something in your life you're not good with that and so I think a crisis that is natural help, uh, happening in someone's life help the person to redirect their life and come back to, to the praxis. We also discuss about uh, work with the energies, parapsychism, self-knowledge. Okay. So, guys, I think we had, like, great uh, insight here on on this little activity that we had to actually brainstorm and think about or in our own experience where we are at in terms of our existential program or in our lives at the moment and what can we do from now practical things that we that we could do to step out of our comfort zone in different aspects of our lives. Each one of us have a different challenge, right? Some are maybe in the professional area, in professional life. Others are in relationships, problems with family, or um, doubts that you have yourself. It's like intraconsciential issues or things that you need to sort out right there is a new message in the chat let's see what um so maria is saying that uh to read things with a lot of humor to learn to laugh not to cry yes this would be uh, a great a great thing especially for people who are more negative from in facing challenges right or difficulties this would definitely help a lot. Cool. Guys, we have to go to the next chapter. We still need to go to the next chapter. So can we go ahead? Yes? Awesome. So chapter two, sense of immortality. The question Professor Valdo talks about is self-awareness, certainty of possessing a sense of immortality and awareness of eternal life inside of yourself in your personal essence. So are you uh, aware that you are eternal, that you will never finish, that you are endless, that you are not going to die and finish? So when did it started? When did you start to think like this in your life? Do you remember the first memory that you looked around you and you're like, it life is not only this, or that's not how I see life. So does anyone remember this moment? I think uh, I uh, since I know myself, <laughs> I have this idea. <laughs> It's never was a new for me since I was a little 
a little girl. That's because I think I, I am an intermissivist. Mm -hmm. Let's I see remember if... uh, when I was a kid that every time the topic of death came up, like either my parents talked about someone dying or, or I heard it on the news and I just could never comprehend or like understood that it that is the end. Like for me, it was, I could not understand how people believed that it was the end. Like for me, it was like, of, like it was obvious to me that there's something after death and it wasn't the end. But of course, as a child, I could never communicate that properly. And I always had this sense, even as a kid, like I'm here for a reason. But, you know, it took <clears throat> until, well, well, I don't know, into my 20s that I really understood, okay, this is my proexis and this is why I'm here. But, yeah. And I guess with 14, 15, I had my first out-of-body experience, like lucid one. And that changed my perspective on death even more of like, okay, I have proof now <laughs> that... <clears throat> I'm more than my body. It was jarring and it was scary at first, but then once you have that experience, you can't really go back. Very interesting. So I have um I have your e experience, right? Uh Sergey talked before about life being uh life and death being an adventure, which has to do with the sense of immortality as well, right? And um, and who else? Who else remembers this moment where you are like, oh, mm, life is not just this. I don't know, but I I'm, I have a suspicion that uh, immortality is one of the biggest uh, traits in intermissives because. You know, everyone that uh, I know from conscientiology had these things like, oh, you know, I knew from when I was a child and I, I feel the same. So I think most of us had this from childhood, at least most of the people I know from conscientiology. So it's interesting. Yeah. Oh, there are two people raising hands, three people, uh, Benoit, and then Kim, and then Miki. Mm, actually, I'm not, uh, I'm not um, like, uh, I'm not sure about immortality, but I'm sure about the continuity between physical life and non-physical life, because uh, I've done uh, some projection and uh, and. And many of them was uh, uh, go outside the body and go back to the body. So I cannot doubt the fact that uh, there is a continuity of consciousness uh, of existential being after the uh, or independently the physical life. But uh, that doesn't mean that uh, there is a form of immortality. I don't know about that. So it's still a question for me. Mm hmm. So you think if you were answering this question from the intermissivist test, you would say no to your to to this question or yes? I would say I don't know. <laughs> I'm searching. <laughs> okay, awesome. <laughs> yeah, when I did the test first time, I had this question that I I didn't know either. So for me, it was a no because I didn't even know you know how I felt about it. Uh, but yeah, but that's a very interesting point that you um, came because up to some point, we see that this reality, especially if we have had projections out of the body, makes sense. But to, to you know, to make sure that this is a, like a reality throughout evolution, obviously, we don't know yet, right? I understand what you mean. In this case here is more like the people who are um who are born and think that oh let's live life the the you know the fullest because when we die it's going to be over so let's do all the things we want to do right yeah i never lived my life like that but uh 
<laughs> awesome. Oh, Kim, go ahead, Kim. Yeah, I, I just wanted to, um, I mean, I didn't say, I didn't put my hand up to counter Magali's uh, idea because I didn't know what she was going to say, but I, so I didn't, I didn't have this as a child. Uh, I was not, um, I didn't think about it. I didn't have a view. I didn't, the, the main, the main thing that I um, remember in that sort of space as a child is finding religion really strange and like wondering why people believed in God and whether that was really a thing that that was, but immortality, I didn't think about, um, I didn't have a view about um, until I was uh, 24. And then I had um, a series of impactful parapsychic experiences that just like essentially made me an instant, um, just instantly made me go, yeah, okay, that's, uh, that's, it's undeniable that I was here before in other lives. And yeah, and then from that moment on, it just seemed like a natural, it's just felt very natural. It just seems logical and feels, it's like, like an embodied thing. Yeah. Mickey and then Grace? In my case, I don't know. I think I was born with this idea. When I was little, at five years old, I was in my grandparents' house. And one time I started to talk with them and with my parents about an old house who was demolished 15 years one or 100 years ago. And I was seeing that old house and the other concierges, grand grandparents, parents, I didn't know anything about them. So for me, it's, I don't know, it's easy, <laughs> it's normal. I, I was always so concierge, I didn't know. So I don't have any doubt about this. <laughs> That's Thank really you. interesting. Grace? I chose the particular country where I was born and actually the religion for that reason, to have that memory. Um, about immortality um, so that helped me uh, remember that there is something more beyond the physical and then I had my experience of um, leaving the body if you may or confirming Im immortality in particular um, a little bit over 12 years ago on the 11th of August 2011 that has changed my life and that's why I'm here today with you guys so yeah I clearly remember when it happened awesome anyone else okay so uh well I can share with you guys my thoughts on this as well um I remember when I was very like maybe six years old I started to think about this I, I i remember i was i guess i told you guys last time I, I used to miss this other reality i didn't know i i just had the feeling of missing people and places that i didn't know and i would look at the sky and and feel that nostalgia inside of me that just didn't stop and um, and I would ju just do this by myself. I would go, we used to have like a swimming pool at our, our house and I would go swimming and just stay there looking at the sky and, you know, have this nostalgia of this place and people I just didn't know. And uh, and for me, the 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 fact that I was, a consciousness was just a reality since back then I just didn't question this was not a big deal to me but I actually had uh out-of-body experiences when I was like an adolescent I was a little older and um but this the sense that I was a consciousness and that I wouldn't die or no one would die and finish and be the end this would like was pretty normal to me so yeah I guess most of you guys who have talked 
uh, about your experience? I would say yes, you would be answering yes to your question, the second question of the intermissive is test, you know, because this sense uh, of, you know, being a consciousness and not finishing with the, the, the death of the body is one of the character characteristics of the intermissivist, as Magali just said. And uh, so, guys, we don't have much time anymore. What we are going to do is you are going to um, answer, if you haven't yet, answer the first and the second question of the intermissivist test, okay? So the first one related to mortifying doubts, if you have any. Um, and the second one, if you have, ha if you have this sense of immortality within your, yourself, your consciousness. Okay. And now I'm going to, uh, talk to you about the next meeting we are going to have and the intermission for those who didn't come last time, the intermission is the homework. Okay. Uh, can I share th this with you guys? Let me see if I can share my slides with you. Hold on. So what you're going to do is first read the uh, chapters three and four. Okay. Can you see the intermission? Yep. yep. Okay. So... Um, yeah, but this one, hold on. Let me just, this is the previous one. Okay, cool. So the first thing you guys are going to do, number one, read chapter three, which is valuable, valuable utilization of human life. And chapter four, conviction regarding existential seriality, which is the series of exis existence, right? Uh, second, insight. Select one passage of each chapter that drew your attention and explain why you found them relevant to you. Three, real life connections. Find real life examples that relate to this chapter. So try to think of things that you experienced in your life that are related to these chapters. Uh, try to remember as vividly as you can with details. It might be a conversation you had with someone, a situation that you went through in your life, a moment, a critical moment, or sometimes when you were a kid or an adolescent and something happened and had to do with uh, these chapters and take notes of these, okay, for our discussion next meeting. And then four, summary, write a summary of each chapter and create a five minute presentation with your own understanding and conclusions on the chapters. So I might ask some of you guys to uh, write, uh, to speak a little, like make a summary of the chapter and uh, about, but with your own understanding, okay? This is uh, important for us to, to hear what you guys have in these this minds, these brains. I want to hear you guys, okay? And five, mind saturation technique. Reflect on the themes of chapters three and four before sleeping. So what you're going to do before you go to bed, you're going to uh, think about the themes. For example, you can do one week, chapter three, the next week, chapter four. And you're going to, every night, you're going to think about that topic and reflect on that. Maybe... 10, 15 minutes before you sleep, 30 minutes, whatever. But do this saturation. Think about it. Sometimes you are at your lunchtime at work. Try to reflect on that because the helpers, the extra physical helpers are going to uh, interact with you and give you some ideas, some insight and some um, reflection, help you with, with your reflection on these things, okay? And write this down. Any ideas, feelings that you have, sensations, memories. Sometimes you are reading or you're thinking about the topic or before you go to bed and you remember someone. You think about someone you haven't talked to them in ages. 
or remember a moment in your life when you were a kid and something happened? Why did that come up into your memory at that exact moment? So make notes, okay? Uh, sensations as well, images or anything that have synchronicities. If you are, you know, in during these times, if you are uh, doing something and a synchronicity happens, you meet someone, you see an article, you see a news on TV, or you talk about some topics with someone. Take notes of this. All this could be relevant for you to think about your intensive course related to these topics of these chapters, okay? And then we are going to bring all this stuff next meeting so we can discuss, right? Have you got any other questions, guys? Uh, so uh, we are going to send this, um, uh, this slide to you guys, okay? The intermission number two. And uh, if any of you guys still haven't got the book, we are happy to send you the chapters. So just let Magali and Kim know, and they are going to send uh, messages to you, uh, the, the file to you, okay? Magali so and Kim? Yeah. It will be, if you are not in the WhatsApp group, because we are gonna put in the WhatsApp group, please let us know so we can, put, uh, we can add you at the WhatsApp group. So you receive all the material, okay? And Grace, you have a question or? Yes, I was going to ask you, Tatiana, uh, private, but I think I just would like the answer now, sorry. So um, regarding chapter two, because we didn't have much time to talk about that one. Um, there is a, this concept about unresolved conflicts and think about people who, you know, uh, we may have unresolved things. And I wanted to ask you about what if, what is um, the deal with, if you have resolved conflicts and you want to resolve conflicts, but it's the other person who is not willing to, to come and, and receive you. Yeah, I think um, the best thing is, do your best, you know, give the, the effort you, you can to try to solve the situation. But sometimes the other side is not at the best moment to, you know, to solve that issue. Mm -hmm. um, and you have to respect that, you know, just respect until they, they are in the right moment. It could be one year from now, 10 years, 10 lives. We don't know. So, uh, and we can help people through energies as well, right? Energies, penta, um, and respect, respect the, that person's moment as well. Um, right. Sometimes this, it's not the right moment for them. And sometimes we are in the same situation, right? People want yeah. to, you know, get this issue resolved but we are not at our moment we are not mature enough we are not healed enough to you know to to go so it's the same thing if you if you want it or um or moment to be respected we should respect other moments as well mm -hmm. so it might be also the uh, situation that they unconsciously want to resolve it in some other life not necessarily this lifetime and uh, not that they don't want to, or not that they are planning to resolve this in another life. It's just that at this moment, they, 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 they don't feel like it. They don't. They are not at the moment. You know, it it could happen in this same life, this life, maybe ten years from now, twenty years from now. Who knows, right? But we need to respect. So it's acceptance, respect, and acceptance. Yeah. No, not respect acceptance respect the you know the space of the other person and yes. uh, and do our best the best that we can yeah mm -hmm. okay thanks all righty guys we are done magali do you have any messages i think oh, just maybe uh, at the end of so next our next meeting is on the 16th of september 
And I was going to say, I was going to encourage everybody like, so during the month, I think Mickey posted a question in the group. I don't think there was any engagement. There was any, any sort of response and I, which includes me, right? None of us, but I, I do think and Melanie's gone now, but I, I think we are a group. We're all here together all across the world. And we're kind of resources to each other, right? Like there's uh, there's a common theme in this book I find is to uh, um, to establish connections with our evolutionary um, friends and colleagues. Um, so maybe we can uh, also make the WhatsApp group. Like if people have questions or if you're doing the homework and something comes up, I would encourage everybody to post a comment, ask a question, and you know we'll we'll see if we can become a bit more engaged and connected that way in the in the month. Awesome. I would love that. All right, guys. It's been a pleasure to be, to spend this this uh, night with you guys. Well, for me, it's night here. Um, I loved it. So many ideas. It was great to hear from you guys. And I'm really excited about the next two chapters. Um, and I hope to see you there. Okay, bye. Bye, everyone. Thanks, bye. See everybody. Okay, bye. Mm -hmm. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.